Uh, look, calm down. You're not making any sense. Eddie Quist is dead. I saw pictures just like we saw in his room. Christopher, the landscape is here at the colony. I love horror movies, so when I get a chance to work in something, on a, or to work on a picture that uh, is either a straight-out horror movie, suspense movie, supernatural movie, I'd kind of jump at the chance because I love horror movies, you know? I think there's a built-in audience for this type of picture, and I'm one of that audience, so I want to make a picture that I can respect as an individual, and then hopefully the horror audience uh, will respect as well and, and get scared, you know? We, we want to scare the shit out of everybody, basically. <laughs> I got into editing because I like making movies. And I was making movies when I was a kid because I got, I was gifted with a movie camera, a uh, eight millimeter magazine camera, Kodak, Cine, Cine Kodak Medallion 8, and a projector. And uh, I had a little splicer with cement splices so I could, I discovered I could actually cut pieces of film up and juxtapose them with other pieces of film and glue them together. And, uh, you know, try to make movies, which I did although I more often than not edited in the camera because I was too lazy to cut up the film and get the cement all over my hands. So literally, I take your close-up and then I go to your close-up and then I go to your close-up. But we were shooting silent anyway, so it didn't much matter. Uh, but actually, editing in the camera is good training because it's like the final cut in your head. Working at New World Pictures, Roger Corman's production company, was really quite a blessing. Now, a lot of people complained because the hours were long, the pay was low, and, you know, you got beat to shit, basically, and you had to keep on ticking. I met Joe when I was a PA uh, on Hollywood Boulevard, and then he got to do Piranha, uh, Piranha being his first big solo directorial project with a screenplay by John Sales, produced by John Davison, where I also got to know Mike Finnell. Mike Finnell, uh, worked on Hollywood Boulevard when I was a PA, he was a PA. And Mike went on to become Joe's producer after a while and produced uh, many of Joe's biggest pictures, like the Gremlins, Inner Space, etc. Uh, and we're still friends, uh, but Mike has gone back to Connecticut. He's living the life of a country gentleman now. Uh, anyway, so watching Joe and working with Joe and having the privilege really of cutting, you know, he'd be out directing on a picture, and, and on Holling it was the same, he'd be directing this movie, so he didn't have time. And now remember, he's also an editor and he wanted to be involved in the editing hands-on, uh, but he couldn't do much while he was shooting because, you know, they shoot these very long days, and he'd actually have to sleep somewhere in there and occasionally eat and show up on the set again. So uh, I got to do the first cuts on all these pictures, uh, even starting with Piranha. And then we'd get Joe in and we'd work together and, and before you knew it, we had a movie. What is it? Bill just got bitten by a wolf. Louis is bitten by a werewolf and lives, becomes a werewolf himself. Well, you know, Joe Dante is, is somebody who when he makes a movie, he almost always makes that movie with a humorous subtext, let's say. And it's a tricky, tricky line. It's a very specific tightrope walk because in the howling especially you need to believe the werewolf story. You need to believe the jeopardy that the D. Wallace character is placed in. Uh, you need to believe all that stuff and yet there's a self-deprecating humor about werewolves that permeates throughout. And, and about whatever subjects that the characters might be talking about. Now, that's part of Joe Dante's worldview, I believe. And this is just me talking here. Uh, he sees the humor in every situation. And he certainly understands irony. It's 
something that's lost on a lot of people today. Uh, and ironic humor. So we, you know, we can have the werewolves, uh, you know, threatening Dee Wallace, and they're going to take her and probably turn her into one of them. And they can be cracking jokes while they do it. I mean, it, it works. It actually sometimes helps to ratchet up the tension. We can laugh. We can laugh with it. But laughter is sometimes an escape valve for something that's truly terrifying. And you can do that with a movie. You may not do that in real life if you, say, have a psychotic killer with a knife blade attacking you. I don't know that I would be laughing. But in a movie, and that's the difference between movies and real life, uh, you can do that. Come on. Come on, Brad. Making a film like The Howling uh, presents particular challenges. Uh, actually, the challenges of every movie are pretty much the same in that if they have a story, a script, if they're dramatic in any way, and which The Howling certainly is, you have to tell that story well. You have to tell the story clearly. You have to make sure that the character relationships are delineated, that uh, the performances are consistent, and you have to make the pacing of the film correct to the material. And, and certainly, and most importantly, because this is the money uh, in, in a film like this, are the werewolf transformations. And you know, uh, makeups, even the greatest of makeups, and especially the greatest of monster makeups, uh, sometimes are designed not to see everything. And, and very often with monster effects, that's the way it is. You don't certainly don't want hard light on a facial werewolf transformation. Not a mechanical one, anyway. Uh, so it, it's, it's the lighting, but it's also how long you hold any given shot, how long you can hold that shot before it works against the scene. So they shot the movie, and what they had was they actually had a wolf a werewolf suit, which uh, appears in the movie only briefly. I, I, I'm thinking now when Belinda Belaski is attacked in the woods and takes refuge in a little shed, uh, you see a little werewolf hand coming in. You see a little bit of the suit through a hole in the in the in the wall there, or the slats, but not much. No faces. We saved the big reveals to later in the picture, actually. And one reason was that after Principal was wrapped, we really didn't have any werewolf close-ups or any of the more complex werewolf shots that we needed. It was the mixture, basically, in the close-ups of bladder effects, which were really great. Rob Bottin had been working with Rick Baker, and uh, I think they were developing and, and using a technology like this, which is one of the reasons why uh, American Werewolf and the Howling Technologies, which, because these pictures came out you know, around about the same time, and then they reflect this technology. Uh, so that's one thing. The other thing is, uh, is actual mechanical heads, where the actor is completely replaced by a mechanical head. Uh, for example, if you see Eddie Quist's transformation in the howling, and you see his snout growing and growing and growing and growing, that's a... Uh, a, a mechanical head that was designed specifically for that moment. And so we used bladder effects, we were able to cut away the hands, you know, maybe some nails coming out, which were mechanical as well, you remember those? Then back to, a, you go from the real actor to the hands, to the head, mechanical head, then you cut to another angle, a side angle. So you have the snout coming out in a side angle, you got eyes bulging in the front angle. So you have to carefully kind of edit all this stuff together and make it seamless. No dissolves though. No trickery. It really looks like it's happening in real time, but of course it's edited as well. But actually, it's, it's, I'm sure uh, the, the movie that you see is the movie that Joe wanted to make, given you know, our resources. I, I think he did a great job of transcending the resources, and it was an international hit, spawning many sequels, uh, to which I would say none of which hold a candle to the original. But that's just me talking. So 
The Howling, great, great film. I don't know what else I can say, except I'm really glad I worked on it. I'm very proud of uh, our collaboration on The Howling, and uh, I think it's a wonderful film that stands the test of time very well. It, it, it's a wonderful movie.